Hi, this is Ayman Sawaf and Josh Friedman. This is our first emotional literacy uh, workshop or event. We'll be doing a lot of them as we go in the future. And uh, there will be more of a long uh, one day event where we will go into more of the practicality and more details and more experiential and more questions and answers. But today we will just give you an idea about how we got into emotional literacy, who we are, and what we've done with it over the last 10 years or more. Uh, coming out from my own uh, growing up, uh, I had I grew up in a pretty beautiful family. They were all business people, and uh, although they put a lot of emphasis on the intellectual part of me and so on, I always grew up feeling something is wrong with me. I always had to uh, need needing approval. I always need to had to be perfect. Always feeling of shame beyond just shame of doing, just shame of being like. And uh, I would always feel guilty because I always felt very happy or I always wanted to have more fun. So although I succeeded intellectually and in my work and my school, there was always a major part of me that is missing that led me later on growing up into becoming a very dysfunctional human being, getting into all kinds of trouble and I had a bad divorce and I didn't take care of my health and so on. That woke me up basically to uh, myself. One day I woke up and I realized that I was just about to die, you know, physically, emotionally, even spiritually, because I had no connection whatsoever to anything. And uh, that's when somebody introduced me to my emotions for the first time. And it's like, I've never heard, of course, I've heard of them, but I thought they were really in the realm of psychology. And that's what, you know, if you get a problem with your emotions and you see a doctor. And, uh, and then that person introduced me to a book by Louise Hay called You Can Heal Your Life. <coughs> and. Uh, it was one of the first books 20, 20 years ago now that introduced the concept of emotions and how they relate to health and affirmations and positive thinking and you know how and, and for emotions and so uh, that led me to start exploring this and at one time I you know it was introduced to the concept of uh, art therapy and certain uh, understanding of emotions and somebody gave me my emotional matrix and gave me the techniques to heal myself and in literally in a matter of six months my life have changed so much from my business life to my emotional life to my relationships it was really an incredible uh, adventure. And as a businessman who's always into profit, I think, God, this is really profitable. You know, how come I never heard of these things? You know, but like you can deal with emotions and your health can improve, you heal yourself miraculously from disease and so on. You know, you start attracting to yourself the most incredible, beautiful people instead of all the junk people I used to attract, you know, and so on. And uh, out of the, I decided basically I want to do something about this, you know, that not one more child will be left behind. Every child will learn about their emotions and I used to be in the lighting business for 20 years or 15 years. So I dropped that and I moved to the enlightening business and I moved from England to California and I decided to really bring emotional literacy. We didn't call it such, such then, you know, to children. And I did the first two films and invested in them all my money and to bring emotional wellness and emotional healing to children's films. They won lots of film festival awards. I've done the first few books about emotions, anger and fear. Nobody bought them, you know, I didn't know how to use them. And one day I was sitting in the hot tub and I was really, really angry. And I started saying, God damn it, those parents, you know, you know, they're so emotionally illiterate, you know, and I heard those two words in my head, emotionally illiterate. I said, wow, emotional illiteracy. And I picked up the phone and I called a few friends of mine, like Dr. Harold Bloomfield, and then later on John Gray, who wrote the books from Men from uh, Mars and Women from Venus, and others famous, you know, authors. And have you heard of emotional literacy? No, no, no. All what you knew was emotional healing. So I thought, well, maybe that is an umbrella kind of word that could really fit what I wanted to explain. So it was about preventive. It was about reading the ABC, the one, two, three, four feeling. Anyway, to make a long story short, we did this and we started a nonprofit organization called Feel.org. Feel stands for Foundation for Education Emotional Literacy. And we released, we used to have a newsletter that was released uh, quarterly to two to three hundred thousand people. Mostly we used to send it to every school teacher, uh, uh, counselors in schools, university professor of psychology department, just name them. And uh, 
And we were hoping through that to create awareness, create, uh, uh, explain the need for emotional literacy. I'm hoping to sell some books later on. But uh, that's where I met Josh. Because having by then created the first, what I thought was the curriculum for emotional literacy for home, for school teacher, for home, series of, of 21 books that teach the ABC of our feelings, emotion by emotion. Uh, I met Josh and who had and his team who have just started a nonprofit called sixseconds.org. And when I remember meeting Josh that first day, they, they were just starting this nonprofit. And I had the, one of the first book, I think, about emotional intelligence and business. And we, I, I remember that meeting, and I said, ah, Josh, you know, you're the one I've been waiting for. <laughs> Here's the baton, you know, I'm done with this. I'm, I'm a businessman, I'm not an educator, I'm not a school teacher, I'm not a trainer, I'm, you know, you take it, I give you everything. So we merged, feel, with six seconds. And uh, since then, I left uh, Josh alone and ran away and uh, <laughs> did other things. And now I'm coming back and coming back and together hopefully we'll be doing far more stuff. But Josh over the last 10 years have done some incredible stuff with sixsecond.org and their concept that is called uh, a book that they have called Self Science, him and his team. And he will share with us more about it. And uh, about knowing yourself, choosing yourself and so on and how the emotional literacy uh, is part of that, you know, a, a new education uh, a system that I hope will be implemented in all the schools in the future. I mean, if we know what he was, if we as ch children, you know, we study what, you know, uh, they are teaching, you know, I mean, you know, life will be life will be much much easier, and reality will be much much more magical, you know, and love will be more abundant, you know. So, uh, so I'm really. You know, I, I'm excited about introducing my partner here, Josh, and I'll let him talk about Six Seconds and all the rest. Thanks, Andrew. Sure. I started uh, to get involved in this work actually when I was a middle school teacher, and I, um, I loved teaching middle schoolers. Uh, so those are 13, 14 year old kids, and they are so emotional, and they're driven by emotions, and I knew nothing about that. And I was a very academic teacher, and I taught humanities, and I loved history. And, uh, and I was working with these kids who were super smart and super interested, but not so much interested in what I wanted them to be interested in. And I remember as a young teacher, I used to have um, parents always coming up to me saying, you know, oh, what should I do about so-and-so? And I, you know, sort of give them some answer. And I, I'm kind of embarrassed now as I look back on those years, you know, because I knew nothing. And now I have uh, my own kids. And uh, I've spent the last uh, 11 years now really focused on learning about emotions and emotional literacy and emotional intelligence. Um, I work all over the world. I'm the chief operating officer of Six Seconds, which is a nonprofit organization. And we're actually, if you hear some noise in the background, it's because we're at the Six Seconds annual uh, meeting. And we have educators and trainers from all over the world. I just got back last week from working with the World Bank and Lockheed Martin. And now I'm here uh, at our annual meeting and we've got these incredible people from all over the world whose full-time work is teaching about emotions. Uh, but I want to really focus today on, on parenting and working with kids and helping understand just this basic language, the ABCs, one, two, threes of emotions, being able to understand what does that mean? So in our, in our work, what we talk about is that emotions are data and they're energy. They're information, they're chemicals. And we experience emotions in our bodies. And the reason our organization is called Six Seconds is because those chemicals last for about six seconds. They're released in your brain, your body, they go everywhere in your body. And they change every single cell in your body. And change the electrical set point. Iman uses the word uh, resonance and frequency. They change the, electrical, the electrochemistry of every cell in your body. And they change the way you think and they change the way you perceive, and they change the way you communicate. We are fundamentally emotional creatures, and emotions form this filter which, which drives us. And we can either pay attention to that and use that intelligently, or we can ignore it, and we can be in the kinds of trouble that, you know, that, that, that we get into when we're not paying attention to what's really working us. So. I'd like to focus a little bit on, on the, those basics and looking at how emotions are working, what do they mean, uh, what are they. 
And I think that one of the things that Iman and I have talked so much about over the years is that there's this characterization in, in Western society that emotions are these negative things. You know, and that people talk about it, like, oh, I've got to control this feeling and get rid of this feeling and eliminate that feeling. And um, the realization that emotions have value. And how do we find that value? And, um, you know, you've talked a lot about using emotions as advisors. Mm-hmm. And that, that discovery that, oh, hey, I have these resources in me. And maybe you could just pause for a moment. <laughs> Maybe you could mention that idea of what do you mean by that when you say emotions can be advisors? Right. It's just to uh, back up a little bit, you know, emotion, the word emotion comes from the Latin emotivus. That's that energy that moves within us. Emotion. motion Energy in motion. Energy-motion. <laughs> and it's an energy that, not unlike any other energy, can turn to power. Electricity is an energy. You don't it's, see it. It's electrons coming together, right? You know, you don't see it, but if you put your finger in the socket, <laughs> ow, if you put the light on, wow, is how we use that energy, how yeah. we use that power. That's what it is. It's only when we don't know how to, when emotionally illiterate, and we put our finger in the socket, and we go to the doctor, that's called a psychologist. <laughs> or a okay? If we really understand and teach our kids how to turn the light on, then it can lighten up our life, and we can see the information, what's, what, what is it all about, you know? I like, I like that metaphor, I mean, because uh, I think it's a great example of somebody puts their finger in the socket, and then they say, oh, this stuff must be bad. It is negative. It's you dangerous. Know? You know, I put my hand on the stove, I burn my stove, oh, stoves are bad. We've got to leave these things alone. And we've all had that experience, though. Right. Mm-hmm. Better pa- than pa- the- pause for one second for our noise here. We, we've all had that experience, which is we've, we've gotten in trouble with emotions, and we've had our kid having a tantrum and meltdown on the floor, and we've yelled at them, and we've, oh, these emotions are terrible, <laughs> we've got to get rid of them. So I, can, you know, I think that metaphor, when you talk about that, if we don't use them well, if we don't refine them, it's dangerous. Yes. And I, th- I think that what people because, have experienced that. Because we are not literate, we tend to react instead of yeah. responding to them. Because they are feedback information, as Josh was saying. They're information. It's our conscience, our consciousness, our whatever, God, whoever you want to call that, is talking to us, you know. If we don't feel, it's like the modem to our soul and spirit, or whatever, it's <laughs> off the hook, you know. Like the only other, one kid in Mexico, when I told him, you know, when we feel an emotion, it's like you've got a message. An email. An email. And that kid said, you've got mail. That was the days of uh, AOL, you know. And I said, yeah. And the other kid went, how do you read it? I said, you just have to feel it with panache, you know, with excitement, with joy, you know. And the other kid said, yahoo. I said, yes, exactly, you know. Kids understood that very quickly, that this is an energy. Now, better than to call them negative and positive, to call them constricting and expensive. Or difficult <laughs> and pleasant. <laughs> Not really, yeah. What is a constricting emotion? It constricts you in one choice of action. I am angry, which means something is not happening the way I want to. I need, it's a call for action, it's a call to take responsibility. Okay, I need, it forces me to read, to, it narrows my options and my choices, so it can help me to focus on the issue. Where, for example, love, it's a very expansive mm-hmm. emotion, very in love. All the options are there. I can go to the beach, I can have sex, I can go and then do this, I can, I can start this project. You know, it's like, welcome to chaos. <laughs> you know, kind of. <laughs> and again, we need to know how to deal with love and how to express love so that the chaos does not basically love hurts, you know, at the end. So it is see them better as constricting and expansive mm-hmm. energy that are both needed, you know, to, to move along. You can't, if you can't have the constricting one, you go in, ah, oh, oh, you become airy fairy, as they say. You know, I love, I love, you know, like, and, you know, your life is <laughs> it pieces, you know. So it is important to understand that they're both valuable, they are raw energy. Yeah. A really negative energy, if you want to call it negative, is when an emotion is not expressed. And a positive emotion is one that is expressed properly. Yeah. And you see? So better not to see negative or positive. Negative is when not expressed, positive when expressed. See them as constricting and expansive. That both our guides, yeah. and information to guide us in our reality. What's happening to get a, you know, see, not a, get a, a diagnosis for our reality, so that to take action accordingly. I like the metaphor of a river, 
and um, with what Iman's talking about in terms of these, in this flow of emotion. If you have the river and you put a dam, then downstream of the river, you're going to have this drying out, rotting area. And it smells bad, and it's poisonous, and it's toxic in the environment. Upstream of the river, the water's building up, and the pressure's building up, and it starts leaking out in unexpected ways. And pretty soon, it bursts the dam, and it's destructive. All of our bodily systems are healthiest when they're in a state of flow. Our blood, our endocrine, our digestive system, everything in our bodies are, are, are designed to be in a state of flow. And when our emotions are, are blocked, and when our emotions are stuck, and when we're dwelling in an emotion and fighting and stirring it up, like many of those teenagers I used to work with, or we're overly expressing it and wallowing it, and uh, like my kids when they were three, and <laughs> having that tantrum on the floor, or a lot of the adults that I work with, when they're pushing those emotions aside and they're saying, I can't do this, I can't feel this, I can't deal with this. I mean, for myself, I remember it used to be that I didn't want to ask people how they were feeling because God forbid they might actually tell me and then what would I do? <laughs> you know, and so I, I was pushing these emotions aside. We, it's we, like, we, do oh, ask, we don't expect an answer. That's really. right. Hey, how are you feeling? You ask it in a way so nobody will fine, tell you. Fine. <laughs> fine. <laughs> But I, I was pushing them aside, and I think so many people do that. That's the damning, putting the dam up. We push these aside, and then we're so surprised when these feelings come up. Or we overindulge in them and wall in them. And I think that the real art here is to be in that state of flow. And the emotions are changing. They're natural. The natural process of emotions is to change and transform. And if we're stuck in a feeling, uh, that gives us a signal that we're not really fully understanding it. We're not getting that data from it. And when we don't understand it, we can't liberate the energy. And uh, an example of this that I like is, you know, sometimes you'll hear um, a teacher or somebody say, you know, well, I had a teacher who said, I wasn't any good at math. And I got so mad, I was gonna show that I was gonna show that guy I can do math. And I got my PhD in astrophysics. And now I work for Lockheed Martin. And uh, it, you know, that anger, when that anger became focused, that anger became focused and the insight opens up. And then it's exactly what Iman's talking about. You get mail. It's like, oh, what is this about? Anger is an emotion that tells you I'm blocked. And if I, if I feel like Iman's blocking me, I feel angry at Iman. I, if, you know, if I think you're blocking me, I'm angry at you. If I think I'm blocking myself, I get angry at me. But I can kind of just get generalized into this mood and I start feeling stuck. <laughs> but if I can, so wait a minute, this thing right here, this is what I'm angry about. If I can really drill into that and get specific about it, and then I say, this is something I want to change. So I'll give you an example uh, uh, with uh, my kids. It's probably true with your kids. Um, my son and daughter are two years apart. And they'll be, they're like best friends and they're playing together and they're, they're having fun. Now they're seven and nine and they, it's a pretty agreeable age in general, but they'll be playing and everything will be wonderful. And then bam, it's like this explosion in 10 seconds, they're yelling at each other and they're so angry, they're so mad. And when I talk to them and I say, oh, okay, well, you know, what happened? And that's what we always start with is well, what happened? Let's rewind the tape a little bit and let's get this inventory. We call this knowing yourself. Rewind the tape. What happened? What were the choices that you were making? What were you feeling? How are you reacting to those feelings? And we can start to say, oh, I was mad. Okay, why were you mad? Well, because uh, Emma wasn't doing what I wanted her to do. So you wanted to do this, and she wanted to do something else, and you thought she was trying to keep you from what you wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, so what my son Max is saying in that moment is that he felt like Emma was blocking his way, and so he got mad at Emma, and he expressed his anger at Emma. Now, what he could learn, and what he's learning very well now as a seven-year-old, is that it's not really Emma that's in the way. There's something that he wants, and he can, he can get what he wants. He needs to think about what that is. And backing up, helping him slow down and say, wait a minute, I'm making a choice. What choices am I making here? I have options. I don't have to express my anger at Emma. I don't have to you know, have a tantrum. I don't have to escalate. I have a choice. I can slow down here and I can step back. I can choose myself. And I can think about what is it that I truly want? What is it? Where is it that I really want to go? What's, what's this really about for me? 
that we call give yourself because it's checking in with where, what is it you want to contribute to. Now, it may seem strange that a seven-year-old can understand this, but we started talking with, this about, with our kids about this when they were three. You know, what is it that they're contributing to? What is it that they want? And when they can start thinking about, wait a minute, what is, where do I really want to go here? Then, okay, well, which choice am I going to make? All right, I know myself. I know I'm angry. I know I usually react to that anger by blaming my sister. But I don't have to do that. I can pay attention to that anger. I can get clear. I can get this focus and go, okay, this is what the, the problem is. And then I can think, what is it that I want? Well, what I really want is to, is to have fun. I really want to be a good brother. I want to... I want to be able to keep playing. And so I'm going to express this in a different way. I'm not going to hide the anger. I'm not going to pretend like I'm not angry. I'm not going to suppress that feeling like the dam in the river. But I'm going to use that anger as a way to focus on this specific issue, as opposed to this kind of general blame, frustration. And I'm going to understand what it is specifically that I want to change. And then I'm going to work on changing that thing. And just, and they don't always do it, sometimes, but it's powerful. You know, some parents, when they listen to somebody like me or Josh talking about this, is that they say, what do you mean? Do you really want us to our kids to scream and get angry and express their anger? Because they only know they know what anger is expressed. It's shouting. Right. It's hitting somebody. You see, emotional literacy is the ability to recognize, acknowledge, and appropriately express our emotions. Mm. Appropriately is underlined. See, but when we see every time my father gets angry, he slaps me or he grounds me, then who wants to be angry? <laughs> you right. know, right? Yeah. Okay. But if I know how to express my anger, I bought my son when he was seven, eight years old. He was a very angry kid. Well, I brought him one of those big uh, boxing punching and I put it in the garage. <laughs> every time he get, see, he needs to get that energy out appropriately. Some kids punch pillows, some people write their anger. There are lots of exercises and techniques that you can teach your kids and we can do that on a whole one day uh, workshop about taking emotion by emotion and decipher it and understand the energy and information, techniques and tools and exercises and questions and answers. But it's important to understand now that when we talk about expressing your anger and your fears and so on, there is appropriate way to do that and there is mm. inappropriate way to do that. Mm. Okay? If you understand that, then you're not any more scared that I'm going to allow my kids to express anger because he's not going to come and hit you. He's going to maybe to go to his room and punch your pillow. Once he, it's important that energy is felt first before you get the information. Mm. Otherwise, they say, don't let your emotions clutter your thinking because they're underneath the thing. You cannot really think clearly. Mm. But once you get the anger out, okay, oh, I see what it is. I mm. want this and I'm not getting it this way. I need to find another way of getting it in a much yeah. more elegant way, you know. But, you know, so this is really important to say that there are tools and there are techniques we'll discuss yeah. at a later stage. So we're talking about expressing anger appropriately. Yeah, I think that that's um, one of the things that I see a lot with uh, my kids and with kids I work with and with adults is that they they get into this kind of inner battle really quickly, and they're saying, I shouldn't feel this, and I don't want to let myself feel this, and I, because of my past experience, like, well, when I got angry before, it ended up in, getting in trouble, or when I was sad before, I, you know, I did things I regret, or when I was jealous, I, I took things, or whatever it is. They, their past experience colors this the experience of emotion now, and so they're saying, oh, I shouldn't feel this. And then they get into this kind of inner battle. And in this inner battle, there is a kind of paralysis. And then they end up getting mad at themselves and disgusted with themselves and feeling shame and feeling, which is crippling. They get so stuck in this. And then they, everything gets in, more and more intense and more and more overwhelming and amplified. And I think one of the biggest lessons here is well, there's nothing wrong with any of these feelings. There's, they're valuable. And if we can start when they're small, we can say, I'm feeling a little bit angry. And tune into that and feel that. I, tell, I talk to people about leaning into the feeling. So as Simon said, you've got this sense of this feeling. If you're not feeling it, if you're not, if you're not feeling it, you're trying to push it away, you can't open the email. 
So when you're in that, in that state of kind of inner struggle at war with yourself, the feelings actually get amplified, they get confused, they get out of control. But if instead we go, okay, hey, I'm feeling something. You've got mail. Yeah. And then you First lean. Recognize, oh, this is yeah. a feeling. You know, acknowledge that's your feeling, not somebody else's. Yeah. That's you can take responsibility for. Yeah. You know, exactly. You know. And go, okay, that's, that, this is a message. There's something interesting here. Mm-hmm. I wonder what it is. And that curiosity, that's what I love about the mail metaphor. It's like, oh, I wonder what that is. Let me find out. Exactly. You kids <laughs> love it too. Yeah. Kids really love it, you know, because it can be playful. Emotion, yeah. let's see, don't see it as psychology or therapy. That can really be yucky. But emotion, let's see, it's fun. We have developed a whole series of activity book and coloring and painting and so yeah. on, using the concept of art therapy to play with the emotions, to explore them and so on. I remember something George said about how, you know, when his, 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 the anger turns to passion. That's what he was describing earlier on when that yeah. kid that he got so angry at the math teacher who became a nuclear physicist. Is that he turned his anger to passion, to correct what's not right, and to become that. Yeah. See, when I used to watch my kids when they were two, three years old, kids naturally they express their emotions. Yeah. You know, they, they nobody told them yet not to. And it so, goes so fast. And it goes so fast. I see them screaming, and they're gonna kill each other, and I run, and it's finished. And they're back to the thing. <laughs> Whoa, you know, I should not interfere at all. Now, obviously, when they grow up, now we need to teach them the tools and technique, because at every age, there's certain, I might, the technique I use now are different than when I use at 10 years old or you know, six years old. Emotion, we, you know, we, we, we keep, you know, learning different skills. But when a kid is angry, he wants food, you know, I mean, the whole neighborhood will know him he's angry. <laughs> you know, you know, he has no shame or so on. He will, the universe will know he's angry. He will scream all the way to the end of the world, you know. Yeah. So, there are tools, there are exercises, there are techniques, and you can figure out the emails, you know. And now imagine if your kids are equipped with, with all that techniques, because see, you know, somebody mentioned to me once, he said, you know, emotional literacy is probably the most sacred of all teaching. Because it's not about creating a new school system and changing the education mm. system. If you teach your kids to become emotionally literate, put them in any school environment, in any family environment, in any crisis or not, they will thrive and prosper. Because mm. they have the tools to respond and to transform that energy into power and use it for profit and success in their life and others. So I think in terms of um, teaching some of those things, uh, I mean, as I mean said, there are a lot of exercises to learn and there's processes, but it, it starts out in a very simple way. And we talk about the term emotional literacy. Literacy means knowing the words, knowing the sounds. So if you think about a child, three years old, starting to develop linguistic literacy. So what she is doing is she's starting to recognize letters, shapes, and, and you'll see this child going, oh, that's an A, that's an A, that's an A. And uh, seeing them in the environment. And then um, she'll start to put them together into words. And you know, maybe recognizing her own name first and some words that she likes. Uh, and then she'll start to figure out, oh, this word means this and I can use it in this way. This word has this purpose. Uh, the same thing is true with emotions. So in emotional literacy, what we're working on is these ABCs of emotions. What is that feeling? What is the difference between feeling disappointed and frustrated? What is the difference between feeling sad and worried? Uh, Between feeling uh, anxious and blaming? And, And we start to get these nuances and we start to feel in ourselves. There's a physical sense of those feelings. We can see it in other people. We start to recognize it in the environment. Just like the kid is learning to read, driving in the car, looking out the window saying, oh, you know, I see exit, exit, exit. You know, and they see it in the environment and they start making sense of it. The same thing with emotions. They start to name them, they start to see them. So a great way to start working on this, first of all, as a caregiver, you need to develop emotional literacy. And this is, um, uh, I mean, I, I mentioned before, that I was very scared of emotions when I was younger, and I was confused by them, and I thought they were random. And kind of learning that there's a science to this, and there's a way of organizing emotions, and they mean something, and they're basic feelings. You know, different theorists. It's really have, easy, too. Yeah, it's easy. <laughs> and, and different theorists have different models of these, and I don't really care about the, the sort of psychological, psychobabble theory. I'm not an academic researcher, I'm a teacher. Uh, and uh, so the the model is interesting, 
but it's not the truth. The truth is in your experience of these emotions. You have them. You don't, you don't need to go and spend years reading about them. You start paying attention to yourself. You start paying attention and naming those feelings. You can get some of the basic ones. Uh, happy, mad, sad, glad. <laughs> uh, get into more sophisticated, disgust, pushing away. Uh, acceptance, pulling in. Uh, anger, something is blocking you. Uh, loss or sorrow, something you love is, is at risk. A fear, something you care about, is you're not sure if it can survive, there's a danger. These basic emotions, uh, you can look at, at, at different models, and I mean, we'll talk later about some of the different um, emotions and what those mean. But the, the key here is for you to start turning, tuning in, like the kids seeing the signs around and saying, oh, that's this word. For you to start tuning in yourself, going, oh, I'm feeling something. I wonder what that is. Having a little curiosity, developing that language. When you start to develop the language yourself, you're then going to be in position to start working with your kids. And you can do this together. You're watching uh, something on TV. You're reading a book. Um, I love uh, Rosemary Wells' books um, about Max and Ruby. And Max is uh, a little brother, and Ruby's a big sister. And maybe I like them so much because they have this dynamic like my own kids. And Ruby's always telling Max what to do. And you know, reading these books when my kids were little and saying, oh, gosh, what do you think Max is feeling? And Emma, the older sister who's like Ruby, saying, I don't know. <laughs> she knew full well you know, that, <laughs> that Ruby was blaming and you know, was controlling. Um, but using that, that environment, like the road sign, seeing, oh, what is this? What is that? What, oh, we would just watch this TV show. I wonder what, wonder what this person is feeling. Uh, we're visiting um, Aunt Bethany, and um, she's sad because uh, one of her kids is sick. Well, you don't have to be a, an emotional rocket scientist to get that level of emotional literacy. It starts saying, connecting these feeling words with the environment. Okay, so step one was developing your own literacy. Step two is starting to use that literacy with the children. And step three is starting to coach the children in what they're feeling. So, you know, if I'm sitting with Iman and he's my son, he's a, he's a big boy now, and, uh, and he's feeling something. I might not know exactly what he's feeling, but I can look at him and I can guess and I can say, gosh, you know, oh, Iman, are you disappointed? Are you feeling jealous? Are you, are you worried about something? And I can start using these words. And what's beautiful about this is when I say the right word, I'll see it in him. He'll go, there'll be like this awareness, this little light will come on in his eye, and he'll now know that word. Busted. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> he'll know that word, but he'll also feel that I've acknowledged him. So we've developed emotional literacy, but we've also developed this wonderful connection and this practice of understanding each other. Yeah, it's important to mention this. Well, I remember when we did the first 21 books for emotional literacy, and it was always for me important to make sure that people understand, parents understand, it's not about emotional healing. It's not because your child is dealing with anger and being a bully that you need to teach him emotional literacy. Yeah. Like this is the alphabet, you know. I remember when I had a store in Los Angeles and I had all the books on the shelves, and I, I would see parents gravitating towards this, really intrigued by the word emotional literacy. <laughs> yeah. And I would just act like a customer and sit down with watch and sing to them while I'm looking at the book. To see what they're talking about. And I would hear the mom telling her husband, You think we should buy this? You know, what do you think is best for, uh, for little Johnny, anger or fear? <laughs> and I would just interfere, Excuse me, if you don't teach your kids A and B and jump C and D and F, they need to have the whole series, you know? They need to understand all their emotions. But then the parents said, But hey, I'm not, I'm emotionally illiterate myself. How can I teach my kids emotional literacy? Yeah. And you know, we, I was computer, Ill, Ill, computer illiterate you know, a few years ago, and I had to learn this recently with my kids, you know, and we, 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 we did it together, you know, we both joined the same social network. <laughs> and so there are literacies that come up every now and then, and we need to learn them as we grow, and as he said, it is really easy, but it's, you, know, you don't need a psychology degree, you don't need to be a science, um, brain science rocket, there are a certain set of rules rules, or not even rules, do's and don'ts, okay, which you can explore. We would rather use the word exploring your emotion yeah. than, you know, uh, this is how it is and so on, because it's, just, it's just not a science to the art. 
It's yeah. really an art, you know, you know, you know it's unlike the intellectual literacy, which is a science. <laughs> well, yeah. less, you know, this is an art, it is more feminine, you know, and so on. So uh, it's important that, you know, those, you know, that we really do that. And it is safe, it is easy, it's long lasting, it's profitable, you know, and it is delightful. It can be really, really, really fun. There are techniques where you can play with the kids batting them, you know, in the bat, and you know, all the way to has, how he plays with his kids and so on. It's really bond the family together. It is the essence of becoming a loving being. What he was talking mm -hmm. about, by practicing and talking and talking and talking more with your kids about this, mm -hmm. we develop what we call an emotional intelligence model, the second cornerstone beyond emotional to see. You build your emotional fitness. You exercise yes. those emotional muscles. That's where growing up from a child to a teenager, you start mm. building those life skills. Mm. Your character, your integrity, your issue of trust and relationship, all those, if you only use your intellect with them, they are okay, but they're wobbly. Yeah. You don't trust your trust very well, you don't <laughs> sure about your character, you know. But if your emotions are included with your thinking in developing those life skills, then you become a functioning, loving human being, successful, and so on. So emotional literacy is important as the core, first cornerstone, mm. and then the practice of it to build that emotional fitness, to build those life skills, then now you can become a, an adult. And mm. well, it's a language of relationship. You know, it's the, and it is really the ultimate relationship because all the way from emotional to see to emotional fitness to emotional depth, to as you go further, the idea is that you're moving to become more and more of a spiritual being at the mm. end, you know, and it is really that relation, ultimate relationship with yourself, with your higher self, with your soul, with God, whatever you want to call that, that really counts. And you want to have that relationship really sorted out before you get there. You don't want to relate to them as you relate to, <laughs> you yeah. know, to your mate, you know, <coughs> to, to blame and anger and this, you know, through therapy, you know. And, and that's where really when you become emotionally literate, emotionally fit, when then a relationship for with parents who really care about the spiritual well-being of their children and so on, which is beautiful, absolutely so. But if you add emotional literacy to it, you know, and emotional intelligence, that relationship, the relationship with the high self of God and so on, becomes a relationship of partnership, mm. not only out of fear or, or, or hence your anger. Mm. It's, because it's, it's, it's beyond even a relationship of love, it's a relationship of partnership you know, and so on. And that is, you know, how important it is, not only to learn how to grow up, but how to, that fitness is important because it's the foundation for future part of your life, you know, become the adult, you know. And that reminds me of a, a study that we just did with um, some members of former NFL football players. So these are guys who have been massively, massively successful. And they've made tons of money, they've been famous. Uh, and we know, unfortunately, that a lot of NFL football players and other professional athletes have challenges off the field. And they're making some bad decisions. And as they you know, get older and they're, you, know, you can't play football forever, you go, you find some other career, you have a relationship, you have your life, there's some challenges that they have, have had. So we did, in this study, we looked at two things. One is we found that, yeah, the challenges that these really successful people were having were, in fact, they had those challenges more than others. So challenges with drugs and alcohol, with violence, with trouble with work, trouble with relationships, um, physical and mental health. So, I mean, there's, there's um, a pain there. There's a challenge there. And then we looked and we said, does emotional literacy and emotional intelligence have any prediction on the challenges that these guys have? And is there a relationship between how emotionally intelligent you are and how successful you are in these life things, these, these life skills that you talk about. And we found that, yes, there's a very strong relationship. And the relationship is strongest for those who are in the most struggle and those who are at the top of their game. So when Ayman's talking about your lifelong path towards uh, abundant success towards where your vision is for your future, your vision is for your next generation's future, that these skills become even more critical as you move not just from struggle but into success because there's, they're what going to really differentiate you and help you tap the full power and wisdom that you have as a human being to make the best possible decisions, to connect with people, and to, to advance uh, yourself, your family, your community, and our world. So these skills are really beautiful, they're simple, and they're 
profitable as I was going to say the word profitable. <laughs> I <laughs> knew. <laughs> me, me, me and my, my wife, Rowan, uh, who's here, we always, you know, sometimes, you know, she, I would be like running around in circle around the project, you know, and stressing and anxiety. And she, she would look at me and she knows how to get to me in a second. I mean, this is not very really profitable. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I in a second. This is, the business, <laughs> this is the business man. I mean, whoa, obviously this is not very profitable because I'm not making any money here. If anything, I'm leaking, you know, and so on. Absolutely so. And, uh, and, and uh, emotions, you know, as we all know, they are, you know, maybe you want to talk a bit about that because you've done much more uh, scientific research than I did. I, you know, I, I come to emotions from my studies of some of the old Egyptian, thousands of years old understanding of emotion. Actually, as for people who know Feng Shui and how, the, how you create the spaces according to certain energy in your house, the old Egyptian had a, an emotional Feng Shui. Every hmm. room was based around one emotion, you know, and, and so You know, that's, that's, I was just in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, and I was walking around the mall, and I was struck by the emotional Feng Shui, if you will, uh, of this architecture. And I was thinking, look, somebody thought about what was the emotional impact they wanted to have in this place. What is the emotional impact they want to have in that place? So, I mean, it's very much alive today. We don't talk about it right. in that way, but it's, it's very much a part the of old, our, our society. Yeah, the old Egyptian came up with the conclusion that now our brain science is saying, as Joshua yeah. started by saying, when you feel there's chemicals that are split from the brain. You know, Every emotion has a different set of chemistry. Yeah. It's not like your table of uh, elements, you know, like oxygen is O and hydrogen is H, and you have different frequency. Now, when you put them together, there's a chemical reaction in your mm. body mind chamber. You know, if you have anger re released, you know, and if you don't deal with it right away and you transform it to passion or courage, and that's what really I said that anger is, then it might spiral down to become violence and, and destructive behavior and mm. so on. The old Egyptian understood that as soon right away as they feel anger that throw energy, they learned quickly in their brain how to feel other emotions to add to the mm. anger, you know, right away it transformed to courage. Mm. See? They knew that if they drop joy over anger, that energy of anger that says it's not happening the way I want to, I need to correct the things. It's a call for responsibility. One drop of joy that means feeling joy, a little bit of joy, you know. That's what's important to know the difference between joy and happiness, as if you're emotional little, they're different. But if you add joy, and that's another story, to the anger, it turns to courage. The courage to correct what's not right. Mm -hmm. See, so notice, I am really angry, and courage is a higher octave, you know. You, you are you're refining that energy in your body, mind, chamber, you know, from a raw emotion to higher octane fuel. And if you put more chemistry or other emotions over, that courage it turns to passion, you know. And that's what he was describing about that student that I was so damn angry that he got the courage to correct it and move the passion to become mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a brain scientist and so on. <laughs> they understood too that emotions, every emotion, and that's another discussion, another day, but they understood how to transform those emotions, you know. And of course, now, you know, they don't, after they learn this, they don't sit down and say, hmm, I'm angry, let me drop a joy. They do it automatically. It's like when you need to eat something, you need a knife and a fork. We don't think I need a knife or a fork. It becomes automatic, you know, they do that. So they understood that was sort of energy. And they knew how to transform that, to use that. Mm. Sometimes, or they've learned, you know, something like, sometimes, you know, I'm finishing a project and I don't have, you know, I, you know, I run, you know, like we all know, we experience, we go on a project and 90% goes very quickly on time and the last 5, 10% <laughs> drags forever. I lose enthusiasm, I lose passion, I procrastinate, you know, and I realize, hey, I've lost my passion, I've lost my courage, you know, it's like I reach a diminishing return. So I replenish my passion. I go in a small relaxation or meditation, I close my eyes, and I conjure anger at will. See, emotions don't have to happen to you, and then you're stuck with it. Hmm. You can use them. There's a bank of free energies in the space. You can channel it through that modem, you know. I remember when my son used to make me so angry, I'm gonna kill that blah, blah, blah. And suddenly, my brain is secreting those feelings, those chemistry. And now when I drop joy on it, it turns to passion. Mm. And then suddenly, I let that incubate. And suddenly, the whole, as you say, the whole chemistry, all the cells have changed. The resonance have changed. And suddenly there's that passion in your body. And you go out and, okay, I'm gonna do it. And suddenly people support you 
and the project is mm. finished and so on. So I can use emotion at will. They don't just happen to us, you know. You know. So this is, you know, in the future, it's important to understand that this is really a source of power. Mm. It's not about just being a good girl and a bad girl, about ethical, ethics and morality, although absolutely they contribute to all of this. They contribute to happiness and wellness and so on, but they are really a massive source of energy and power that we can use if we know how to mind that properly and we know how to refine it with our body, you know, and you know, express it. You know. It reminds me of a really important principle, which uh, I think sometimes people forget. We don't just have one feeling at a time. You know, so when I'm having an argument with my son, uh, the typical situation for me is um, I want him to do something. He doesn't want to do it. Um, I start to feel helpless. I start to feel hopeless. Oh my gosh, he's only you know, four, he's only five, he's only six, and I can't even get him to do blah, 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 blah. I'm a, you know, oh, what am I going to do when he's a teenager? <laughs> I start to feel this kind of powerlessness, and then I start to feel angry because I feel stuck. I feel that way is blocked. And then I start acting out that anger. I get more angry. And then I start feeling ashamed. Oh, I'm a terrible father. I'm supposed to be this emotional intelligence teacher. How can I be so mad at myself? <laughs> anyway, at the very same time, I feel love. I feel hope. I feel connectedness. I feel passion. I feel joy. I feel wonder. I mean, here's this strong... I remember when my son was maybe two, three years old, and um, he and I were having this argument and we're just standing facing each other and we're yelling at each other. And, um, and then I'm just I'm like, wow, what a strong person. You know, I'm three times the size of him. What a strong person, how beautiful that is. You know, and we have these paradoxical feelings at the same time. And I, I like the word paradoxical feelings. They're not opposites, they're not contrary. They're paradox. It's, it's fascinating that I can feel love and appreciation and respect and, and wonder at the very same time I'm feeling rage and, and disgust and hopelessness. So part of the opportunity, what you're talking about in this uh, emotional alchemy, this mixing together of feelings, is recognizing I have multiple feelings right now and saying, hmm, okay, what am I feeling in this moment? Don't just stop with the first answer. And this is the more sophisticated emotional literacy. Earlier it was like, okay, let's identify a feeling. Well, now let's identify three feelings. And I'm emphasizing this one right now. I don't have to. I can emphasize, I can add this one. I can put a little more of this. I can connect with this. And that gives us this, as you said, this, this bank is open for us. It's, um, some neuroscientists use the, the, this phrase that I like a lot, which is, the world's largest pharmacy is in here. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I would say it's in here. You know, we, we, can, we have this, all of this at our disposal. And we just... Well, that's where the addicts are. <laughs> <laughs> we can lean into that and just go, oh, look, I'm, I'm angry, yes, or I'm sad, or I'm jealous, or whatever. But I'm also this. I'm also joyful. I'm also appreciative. There's so much to be grateful for. As a, even when things are really awful with, at home and things are complicated, there's so much to be grateful for. I mean, what a, what a gift it is to be with, you know, in this role of being a parent, of being a teacher. And there's so much to be appreciative of. And just tapping into that as well. Now, remember, you know, emotional intelligence, like any other intelligence, can be used for negative and for positive, mm. you know. And I, you know, just commenting on something you mentioned earlier, is that, you know, uh, when you learn to be an emotionally literate parent, you know, it's not about being perfect. Yeah. It's not about not making mistakes. Okay, actually, thank, thank goodness, right? Be out of a job. <laughs> actually, your kid will correct you very, very quickly. Or your reality will show you that you're wrong. And you need to be careful. Like, I remember, you know, my son at once, you know, what, you know they hear me talk about emotional literacy. You know, you know I, I taught my kids were a bit late. They were, like, already 14, 15. So yeah. they already... Kind of messed up. <laughs> well, not really. In a very <laughs> nice way. <laughs> but you know, one time, and I think it's the first time with one of my son, you know, I was sick in bed and I, he was the only one in the house and I really needed him to come to get me some my medication. And that's his first girlfriend at 14 and he's on the phone with her downstairs and he would not answer <laughs> anything. And I'm, I couldn't even get off the bed, out of the bed, you know. 
So I screamed like the, I don't remember ever being so angry and so loud. And all what I heard from him coming up and saying, "Oh, so you're emotionally literate, huh?" <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be used against you, you know. And uh, he will not. That's a good it. sign. It's a, a good sign. sign that they are really know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> I asked my daughter. She's nine now, and. Um, um, my wife said to her, um, so, you know, well, what do you think emotional intelligence is? And uh, she said, well, it's, it's being smart about feelings. And I said, oh, okay, that's, that's good. Um, what about um, when you, you can know a lot about feelings, but what about also um, using them, like being smart with them? And, and she said, oh, yeah, that's true. So it's being smart about feelings, like you know a lot about them. That's like you, Daddy. And then there's being <laughs> smart with feelings. And that's when you make wise decisions with your emotions. Huh. You're um, nine years old. <laughs> you, you can come up here and teach. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely.